Hey everybody, welcome. So we are here this morning for the webinar and uh, we have Peter Ward with us. He is a professor of geobiology at the University of um, Washington. Uh, yes. And uh, by um, uh, coming in by Zoom, we have uh, Ken Ward, no relation as far as we know, um, and Michael Foster, both, both, and Michael Foster, both. Valve Turners, uh, and we, here we have, here in person, we have Leonard Higgins and Annette Clapstein and me, Emily Johnston. So thank you very much uh, and welcome. Thank you. Uh, and so some of you may have had a little bit of an introduction to Peter Ward um, by reading the David Wallace Wells article in New York Magazine a month or so ago. Um, and uh, so you may know some of the scary pronouncements and, and uh, or at least possibilities that he has presented us with as a scientist. Uh, but Peter, I thought I would ask you uh, just to, to outline that real briefly for those who haven't read anything about it. And you know, so if you could tell us a little bit about your, your study of, extinction, of uh, previous extinctions and how you think that might relate to what's going on now. Thanks, and I guess, um, I, have, I, guess I should be introduced as Peter Ward, AKA Chicken Little. <laughs> Because <laughs> it seems like the sky, I've said the sky is falling too much. Um, my sister, I used to be on NPR here a lot. My sister would say, oh, oh, here comes that dark Dr. Doom. I, I, I think you need to balance the fact that environments are always crashing. I mean, there, there are catastrophes that happen on any planet, any place, and our planet is no exception to that. The exception is that we've stuffed, what, six billion people onto a place and we don't really have enough elbow room so that the catastrophes don't run into us. And we've become the catastrophe, of course, over and over and over from this, what I still think is runaway population. Uh, the number one problem facing this planet is too many humans. And then I think we, we, this is a politically unpopular thing to say in many societies and it's certainly in many Christian nations, of which the U.S. seems to think it still is, is that's an unpopular thing to say. But uh, any carrying capacity, I mean, any closed system, and we're in a closed system, can only support so many of a given species. And, and the, 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 how, what is ours? Right, and I think, you know, I think the, uh, how a lot of us would respond um, to that in terms of the population issue is, we don't know what the carrying capacity of the earth is. What we do know for sure is that the carrying capacity of uh, like first world folks consuming stuff and buying stuff and throwing stuff away uh, is not anything like what we've got right now. And so, you know, the people who are causing by far the most damage are a, a small percentage actually of the population, world population. Um, and, and most of the world population isn't doing anything like the harm, unfortunately, that our society is doing. Um, so anyway, so I'm sorry, I sort of interrupted you with that. No, it's just one of the most striking invitations I've ever gotten, in fact, and this is what's, again, really spooked me. I went to Australia for 2014, and while there, DARPA, which is the military establishment for research for the United States, they asked me to come give a keynote to their, their every, I guess once a year they bring together all the people who are really building the scariest weapons, and they said, the dinner before we could have a nice time and they wanted the keynote to be what can mass extinctions te teach us about making new weapons oh my god <laughs> I mean, and then my dean in australia said this is a joke you know that the Amer not even the americans <laughs> yeah, could come but up with it it was no joke yeah um and i was busy happily um for the next thousand years i was busy i couldn't quite get there for the next thousand years but it, it is there have been really scary, awful times in the past, and one of the aspects that I keep being struck by, I have so many wonderful colleagues, and Doug Irwin of the Smithsonian is one, and he and, and a guy named Rothman from MIT, they've been calculating what is the rate of carbon dioxide rise now compared to that that we think set off the greatest mass extinction of all time at the end of the Permian. And that latter was caused by a huge extrusion of volcanic rocks, and volcanic rocks have lots of gas entrained within it. So it hits the surface, bubbles out lots of, we think of bad volcanic emanations, but carbon dioxide doesn't smell, you can't see it, and it's so powerful. I mean, this is what always strikes me. If you get a little jar, and you get a thousand molecules in it of various kinds of gases, and if you have 
a thousand of those millions, so you've got a million of them, let's put a million little molecules, if you put a thousand in there, if that becomes the Earth's atmosphere, we have runaway greenhouse. I mean, we go from 400 to 1,000, and you're talking about one of the greatest catastrophes, and that is what the Permian extinction was, was we increased the number of carbon dioxide molecules relative to other gas molecules. And it went up to over 1,000 parts per million. So we are now putting more CO2 into the atmosphere faster than this greatest catastrophe the Siberian traps did. And when, when did you first realize this? What, what, what year would you say you understood the connection of the end Permian to what's happening now? Well, it's a long story, but the fun part, of course, was in my field, paleontology was just totally ripped up and remade in 1980 when the Alvarez group said that it was a, an impact. Mm -hmm. And a couple of my, uh, the people that were, I was learning from, David Raup, one of the most famous paleontologists, then started saying that all mass extinctions were caused by impact. And what this did was it took the focus off earthly aspects and really set back, I think, for a long period of time, this increasing understanding that short-term carbon dioxide rise by any aspect led to periods of climate that were destructive to the biota, uh, times when it got so hot, or it, it doesn't even have to be bad times per se, but changes that are fast. You know, organisms need predictability. And it isn't the killing temperature, but getting there really quickly and going back. It's the back and forth. And so when you start increasing CO2, you increase instability. The rise in CO2 right now, we just saw two fantastic examples of this. That rain that happened in Houston. This is, to try to say this is not related, to the increased CO2 in the atmosphere, it's not a climate change phenomenon, is doing everybody a disservice and is tantamount really to, to a wide-scale war crime. If you and your government is hiding the fact that we are killing people without acknowledging it, at least we can say, look, we've got this runaway problem. We know a lot of people are gonna die because of this, but we acknowledge the problem. I mean, let's go to 12-step processes, an alcoholic, Here's my problem. I mean, we as a society are producing too much of this gas, and if we keep going, it will kill us. Every alcoholic knows. It will kill me. And then you go through steps. And one of those steps is admitting, I admit I've got a problem. But we don't even have this, any of these steps in place, and this is the frustrating part. So the mass extinctions, again, were short-term periods when a huge percentage of the biota died off. Uh, I began to understand in the 80s that impact didn't do all this. And I'm sorry about this long circuitous route, but it was, we went out looking for impact. And this is the worst way to do science, is saying, I know what it is, let's go find that evidence. Instead of, let's go out, what's out there, and let's put a series of hypotheses that might be able to explain that evidence. And there were so many impact hunters, and every one of the big five mass extinctions was sooner or later blamed on impact. Sammy, sorry, sorry, I got a runaway dog. Sammy, uh oh, come here. He's gonna hit that white cord, and I know there's a disaster. Sorry, sorry, folks. We've got dog love here. All right, there you go. Come here. So, I mean, look, look at this, this happy creature. We've got this beautiful mammal here. Um, I'm gonna put him out of harm's way. So there he is, Sammy the dog. Say hi, everybody. <laughs> hi, everybody. And, and this is the happiest, cheerful little monsters that we humans made. But all these guys appeared after one of the big mass extinctions. All the mammals really took off like crazy after the dinosaurs are killed off. Mm -hmm. So if we are in a sixth extinction, I hate that, by the way. I really, what you're doing by saying there are only five big mass extinctions is saying that the time before animals, the Precambrian, doesn't count. And yet there were major extinctions back then. Right. Early oxygenation. Uh, you have these snowball earth events, you have lots of them. So we're actually in the 10th, which is a nice round number, if we are moving forward. So yes, we are looking at rapid runaway greenhouse increase in climate. And these were, I think I termed it first in a Discover magazine in 1986 as uh, greenhouse extensions. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, a relevant term. You said 86, is that what? I think so. It was yeah. a Discover magazine, so it wasn't um, published 
research, but at least it got out there. Sure. And the term is being used quite a bit. Yeah, sure. Probably some Russian invented it before me, like the light bulb. But, <laughs> but you know, these terms are easy. Yeah. Well, interesting. I was just trying to think politically how to sort of mesh that with. So that's interesting because it's just a few years before James Hansen gave his testimony to Congress, right? And, yep. And so, like, and and it's several years after we know for sure that Exxon and the other oil companies knew about climate change and knew, you know, there was a quote in 78, uh, you know, that the best available science uh, indicates that we have uh, five to ten years to, to, to change our energy system, you know, in order to avoid catastrophe. And that was in 78. So, like, there was a lot of knowledge that was gelling at that moment in time. Um, and, you know, due in large part, of course, to um, a campaign of you know lies and politician buying by the industry, you know we have failed to actually respond to that incredibly uh, important knowledge. Um, but you know it's interesting because you, you know when you talk about this, you know people have been talking about climate change as a potential threat to, to human beings and and maybe to other species for a long time, and certainly a potential threat in terms of. You know, like when I was young, I understood like sea level rise, lots of cities at sea level is going to be big problems and so on and so forth. Um, I didn't understand the extent to which the, the existential threat, you know, and when you're talking about extinction of, you know, say anywhere between 10 and 95 percent of the species on Earth, um, that we're talking a kind of existential threat that like we're not really prepared to even think about, you know, uh, let alone respond to. And I've wondered often, like, should that even matter to some degree? I mean, obviously, the, the fact that people are suffering and, and that millions more and billions more people will suffer, like, that ought to be enough, right? It shouldn't, it sh we shouldn't require practically the end of life on Earth in order to be motivated. And in some ways, maybe some folks would argue that it's demotivating the bigger it gets, you know? But so I guess I wonder if you have thought a lot about. Uh, I mean, I don't know if you've get done any presentations to politicians, for example, or if, you, if you've thought about sort of what the best way to frame this incredibly scary information is. Or do you see that as a scientist that your, your job is simply to present the information and it's other people's jobs to sort of figure out how to manage it, you know, politically and socially? Or No, I think the jobs of every scientist is to get out and put it out. If you have information that is relevant to society, sure. and almost any, even the most arcane basic science, really there is probably something that's societally important. Uh, what I've tried to do is just write op-eds. Um, it's hard to get such things published, but I did one for the Seattle Times Ten, I don't know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, but Jay Inslee, re, when he was still representative, our current gov governor, responded beautifully, I mean, personally, and said, you know, you're writing about the effect of climate change in this region. And at that time, the levels of carbon dioxide were much lower. But we are, we in the Pacific Northwest region are experiencing strange things are happening. Um, I live on a small lake in the, the foothills I've been there 10 years, I've owned it for 10 years. For the first time ever, the lake froze this winter. And we had the wettest winter, I think we had, but, but it was coming with cold. And the really nasty awfulness, of course, is when you get a snowstorm in Washington, D.C., and the climate deniers say, look, it's snowing, there's no... What they don't understand, a warming world puts more water into the atmosphere. And it's gonna come out, and there is gonna be cold spots. And so you've got this stuff going on. Uh, I argued to a major talk that I gave to the UW. Once a year, they get they ask one faculty member to give what they call the annual faculty lectureship, and in that, I tried to make the argument that when we train a PhD, more and more now it used to be a thesis. Now what we do is they're allowed to write three or four or five published articles and just staple them together because it used to be you would write the thesis and then you'd have to rewrite the articles and mine it. Let's be more efficient. My argument to them was let's have one of those articles required for the public. One of those four has to be not for your peers, but is for the public in general. And even as the arcane physicists, make them realize they're funded by us. And why do are they not required to give back? And yet when you're talking to I found the president of my university that time, or all the deans, and I saw them nodding sagely away, thinking, this guy's an idiot. 
He doesn't get it. You know, this, we don't do it that way. Institutions become conservative and hidebound. We do it our way. But that is the right way. The right way is to, to have everybody required. You, we are paying tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands from public money to train every PhD. And it gets into the millions. Shouldn't the public get something back from that? I mean, really? And so this is, again, a societal aspect. And, and hopefully things change. Well, that's interesting because it actually also, I think, would automatically speak to people being uh, not always super specialized and you know, and approaching things holistically, uh, at least on occasion, and at least remembering to do that. Um, because if you're speaking for the general public, you're going to have to explain things in a different way or have to approach it in a different way. I want to sort of open this up, lest it just be a conversation between the two of us. Um, and I know that other folks like wanted to, uh, you know, uh, ask you questions or. Um, uh, and I think Leonard, uh, I think you had one yeah, all I, lined up. Yeah, um, uh, I'm really happy that you that you've joined us, and, Thanks, and so appreciate the way you've spoken out um, with your depth of science. I have to voice a frustration though, um, and and that is just the amount of material that you provide in your talks, and it's all very interesting. It's all a good representation of the science and that together with I think just a, a general um, reticence on the part of scientists to not want to appear that they're talking about doom um, from my perspective buries the, the, the primary message that we're at a point of emergency and the one piece of information that was glaring in the talks I listened to was the threat of sea level rise salination of arable land. And, and I'd really like to see those risks um, talked about more directly. Uh, my impression from the science I'm hearing is that we have uh, maybe two to three years for us to really begin the ramp down of carbon emissions. And that's because this ship, that this human civilization on the planet, it's not a speedboat. You can't turn it on a dime. It's going to take years for us to turn this ocean liner, and we need to start now. And so I, I'd really like to, to, to hear, you know, how it is as a scientist to deal with that challenge and how we could get, how I'd like to see scientists speak out more strongly about the emergency that we're at. Well, the thing that bothers me too, though, is that science is predictive, but scientists are always careful. And if you try to go out on a limb, because some things you do have to go out on a limb, and that's, it's built into the institution of science that you don't do that. Or, uh, I mean, Jim Hansen has done more for raising the understanding of the problems, but my only problem with Jim Hansen is that some of his estimates just were way out of bounds in terms of the possibilities. Several years ago, he was predicting sea level rise by the end of the century um, in multi-feet, when the data, even at that time, suggested it would be far less than that. So you start crying wolf, and very quickly you lose your credibility. That's the problem for the scientists. How do you make it dire enough that people listen, but at the same time, you use data that can actually back up what you're saying? And yet we're in these systems like sea level rise. If we had a breakaway of the West Antarctic ice sheet, or if we had what they call an ice sheet collapse, you could have a 10-foot sea level rise in 10 years. And we know this happened a million years ago, and that it's theoretically possible now, and we don't understand ice sheet dynamics. Underneath Greenland and underneath uh, the ice sheets of Antarctica is going to totally dictate the next 500 years of human civilization. If they continue to slowly melt as they are, then it's going to be slow enough for society, I think, to get a, a grip on it. But if we start getting jerks, which is the way systems do work in general, you get slow change and then bang, something really nasty happens. Well, this is where society is going to have a really tough time coming up with it. And what I've tried to think about and try to get others to think about, economics, the dismal science. 
How do you get people to wake up? Well, you get them to wake up when it's a pocketbook issue. So here in the Seattle area, we just built a new runway to SeaTac. And let's put it this way, our airport in the Seattle area is one of the very few in a coastal city that isn't built on fill in the middle of a body of water that's going to flood it within the next century. I mean, you land in San Francisco or, you, or Oakland or Hawaii or Sydney, most of the Chinese, just Japan, they're all built on fill. And sea level is going to take every one of those things out. So I bring up Seattle because in the easiest construction situation, it cost $1 billion to add one runway to a place where it was already flat and you just had to grade it and put asphalt on it. And yet, because of the complexities of building an airport, that's a billion dollars. So what is it going to cost the world in the next 50 years when sea level has risen to the point that storm surge, you know, it's not the rising sea level that gets them, it's those storms just as we had in Florida, just as we had in Houston. Storm surge rips things up. You're going to be ripping up airports. So what percentage of the United States gross national product by 2100 is going to be, have to be spent for infrastructure mitigation? Think about railroads. Railroads run along coasts. We go from Seattle to Vancouver. It runs beautiful coastal, a lot of it's right along. All that stuff has to be replaced. Freeways, all that stuff. I, I have to say though that that, I mean, this line of conversation is kind of what I'm talking about because where your focus has gone to is infrastructure maintaining business as usual. And we can't do that. Um, I don't think that we can afford to focus on those kind of things. I think that our, our globally, our food systems are threatened. Yeah. And, and that um, it's gonna, those kind of crisis points are gonna be something we need to address much more quickly and that we need to turn our attention away from trying to maintain business as usual. Yeah, but let's go back to food systems is what you said. Food systems is the food is made, but then the food is distributed. And so it doesn't do you any good in the world to have this boundless crops if your infrastructure can't get it to people. And we're not an agrarian civilization anymore. The megacities themselves are the greatest challenge because we are concentrating ever more people into places where goods have to go in and goods have to come out. And these become these huge living entities. And climate change is going to affect that, that food in and food out. Um, I totally agree with you about food supply in that the actual fields themselves are under great threat. But they're under threat for two things. They're under threat both from climate change, but they're really under threat from uh, evolution. Because what we have done, we have just done the equivalent of the Manhattan Project. And that bomb is called CRISPR-Cas9. This is the genetic replacement mechanism. And what I've tried to get across to friends and people is that genes are like genies. You know, you put genie in a bottle, it never stays in there. Genes, the bottles that we put our genes in are our bodies. And yet we are now messing with replacing genes in such a way that the U.S. just allowed a new type of mushroom to be put on the shelves that they use CRISPR for. The Trump administration let it bypass all rules and regulations. So I, I believe the genetic aspects that are related to food and food supply are as dangerous as plutonium and, and nuclear weapons were in 1945. The scientists lost the atomic bombs. We're losing the genetic bombs. Um, I don't want to leave out Michael and Ken. Uh, so does either one of you have a question ready for um, Peter? Hey Peter, thanks for doing this. Thank you. Uh, I guess I am. I don't know, it's echoing there. You're not echoing for us, Ken. You're okay. Okay. Um, I'm curious to see if you have any thoughts about how we might respond as activists and scientists to the red team, blue team proposal from uh, Pro. <laughs> I mean, it's a part of me that the most intelligent thing to do is just try to disrupt the things, stand outside it, but I could see you can argue it both ways. Uh, I, I've gotten so old, I'm looking at my picture here and that can't be me. Where's my dark curly hair? 
some of us survived Nixon and James Watt, who was the monster who ran Department of Interior years ago. And we all thought it was the end of the world with him. I, I, I think that the current monster is going to have the same sort of fall that Watt did because this guy is going back and forth to Oklahoma and doing his own businesses. But nevertheless, it is a time that is causing more and more young people to become activists. And increasingly, you could say that in spite of all evidence to the contrary, it may be the action of Trump and the cronies that are there are actually saving the United States and its constitution in that younger people are now recognizing that when people such as our elected president, really, really, um, tramples, uh, that his people trample in this way, that you require polite but firm activism and no, and a hell no. Uh, at this stage, I do believe that we are building an entirely new cohort of environmentally interested millennials that are understanding that this it just can't be allowed to take place. But that, so that whole red team nonsense, I think, is crap. Michael, how about you? Michael? Apparently you can't hear us. Yeah. Huh. Okay, sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm hyper-focused on um, climate recovery getting CO2 down uh, before we uh, run into this uh, extinction wall that we're already up against. Um, so I'm wondering about uh, your thoughts about making changes quickly enough uh, to avoid uh, eventual, eventual irreversible extinctions. Um, when the, when the policies and the politics and the legal structures are not there yet. Um, because that's what our action really is all about. The idea that um, we, we, it's just time to get started and uh, nobody's offering us any real options at a time when we can't delay. Well, there are options. Obviously there are options in our lives um, I, I, I've got a friend, Mike Roddy, from the Bay Area who is up, and, and he's been haranguing me and others of the scientific ilk and say, what are you actually doing, right? And I, always, I, I sit back and, oh, I wrote some books, I'm off the hook, I've paid my money. You know, you can't do that, right? You can't do that. And one of the things he reminded me about and shamed the hell out of me, and it got me back, is that I was eating red meat for a while, a long while. And he said, look, if you're eating... Did, go back and look at the climate change effects of those beef cows you eat. So he's gotten me back on a vegetarian diet, which really, if you start reducing the meat that you eat, one person can make a huge, huge change. But secondly, it's getting people out to vote. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt because my battery is about to die. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to leave the call. But... Um, I'm all about the individual and the collective, and what I'm looking at is the rising CO2, and until that starts dropping several percentage points per year, um, we're really not on a pathway to ever see 350 parts per million again, um, not in any meaningful human time frame. And the species that will be lost over the next few centuries could trigger some of these uh, ecosystem collapses. So. Just thinking in terms of until the CO2 starts declining, um, what, what options are there for, because I believe every individual has to do their part. Of course, I'm doing mine as best I can. But what else is there? Well, I mean, obviously, we, we need to get out. There's got to be carbon burial. I mean, there's got to be a, a charcoal is one of the most efficient ways. Bury as much charcoal as we, we can. But we have to get to blue states and their governors and have the blue states, because the red states aren't going to do anything, right? But we do have places like California and Washington and Oregon. And there we have progressive governors that understand the, their, 
their coastlines are hugely in threat. And I think, again... And yet we have Jay Inslee who is doing nothing to prohibit the new fossil fuel in infrastructure. I call him the green washing governor because he claims to be a green governor and yet he's doing nothing. That's our political system. Even the so-called progressives are doing nothing about it. And I don't see any, you know, anything left except direct action on our part to stop the fossil fuel companies. I, our political system simply doesn't work. Well, I agree, but on the other hand, I, I, I was Seattle was the most tear-gassed place outside of Saigon in 1968 to 1971. We, Still is. <laughs> just, it, it was, a lot of direct action can take place on the coasts, but Inslee, as bad as he is in that regard, he's a whole lot better than those guys in the Western interior. I, I, at this stage, you have to, these are the cards you were dealt. You know, the greatest single revolution of my life, from an energy point of view, was fracking. This was totally unforeseen. I mean, I, I never thought that, that the communist wall would come down, and then it came down in a couple of years. But when fracking happened, and we're driving around with $3 gas, if you had said 10 years ago that gas would be $3 a gallon, you would have been laughed at. We remember we were at the peak oil and all those conversations, and then fracking happened. And this has been a disaster. Cheap natural gas has been an absolute, complete f***ing disaster. Right. Because now you, you don't even have to get coal to ruin things. You've got cheaper natural... And to say that it's clean oh. is such nonsense. So this, again, was one of these unforeseen aspects of life that happened. But boy, has it made an effect, and it will continue to. How quickly do you think we need to get CO2 out of the sky? Um, I, I, my hope in this world is that we can keep it no more than 500 parts per million. I think you're right, the 350 is fool's paradise. But even at 500, that's certainly going to be causing sea level to, to keep increasing in its rise. The second thing, on the whole sea level rise, you see the graph stop at 2100 because, unfortunately, it's asymptotic. This is a curve that keeps going up and it goes up faster and faster and faster because of the positive feedback loops. Uh, we need better modeling, obviously, but you can always say that. But sea level change, to me, is the single greatest threat of what the rising CO2 will do because it directly affects food supply and food systems. And again, going back to, to its, its supply, but also its distribution. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the ocean because I think also, you know, I, I, I have read a little bit about, I haven't read the book yeah, Under a Green Sky, but I also understand that with um, the uh, extreme acidification uh, of the ocean that's happening with yes. climate change, um, that we are, that it's not just sea level rise that's a problem, what's also a problem is, for example, the ocean is, is starting to produce a lot less oxygen, you know, and so if we're going to, uh, you know, a, a, a low oxygen scenario in the ocean, and the ocean is basically dying on our watch. I mean, doesn't that actually cause problems far beyond sea level rise even, in terms of you know how quickly it's gonna affect the rest of life on Earth? Yeah, it is, and ocean acidification. It's interesting, in the 60s and 70s, uh, acid rain was a huge problem, mm -hmm. and at least there was political action that did something about that. But acid oceans hasn't had that same political feedback because those lakes were in Canadian or U.S. waters. And so two countries had to deal with it. The oceans are owned or not owned by everybody. But one of the sad facts of physics is that cold water takes up a lot more CO2, which is a good thing, but the acidity is affecting little creatures called pteropods, especially in the Arctic. And so Arctic food chains are crashing. Look, if you look at how much fish is coming out of Alaskan and Russian waters, we think that the cold oceans have lower diversity, they do, but they have huge abundance. And so in terms of biomass, fishing is really an important part of human food supply now. I wish that it weren't as much because none of it is sustainable. And yet we need to keep feeding people. And the acidification is hurting the cold oceans way worse than the warm oceans. And so we are really looking at really big time problems in the Alaskan waters and the waters around here, acidification is going up really fast. Going back to a local level, I live in a place that has a septic system. 
And those of us who live in the cities, or if you live in the cities, you've got sewers all tied up. But a huge population, and ever more people who retire, are moving to places with septics. And on the lake I live on, only one out of two houses has a septic. The rest are covert spills into the lake. Mm. So I want our governor to relook at the Washington State rules about septic systems. So this is a political action we can do because when we are pumping nitrates and phosphates into Hood Canal, into Puget Sound, you are exacerbating these problems. Right. Why don't we give tax breaks to even partial septics? I mean, the way septic systems work, you have to have a drain field, it's got to be a certain size, and if it doesn't reach that, you don't get it. Half a septic is better than no septic. Part of a drain field is way better than the things we have. So, I mean, nobody wants to think about poop, and yet it's all connected to this climate change aspect. And this is, again, and where farming, too. farming yeah. citizens need to see the holistic side of this. You live in a city, you better think about where your food's coming from. Ned, did you have any particular questions for Peter? Or? No, I mean, I just, I guess I just go back to, um, I don't see how we make this work within the current political system. Um, I think we have to have a massive system change or it doesn't work. And that's why we do, you know, why we have done what we have done, because there is no, I mean, you talk about the fracked natural gas. I mean, look what's going on in Tacoma right now. They, they're putting in this fracked natural gas plant. Jay Inslee could take executive action to disapprove all of these things. He has not done it. And I guess I, you know, you say we work within the system we have. I guess I'd like to hear your take on how, how we could conceivably do that because I don't see it. Well, again, I, I have a good friend and we've just had, it, it's, it's an amazing, what a mirror of discussions he and I have been having. And we were talking two nights ago about what good does it do for us to get arrested? So how far do you take it? Um, he, he was saying, it's time to do targeted assassinations. And I went, no, people, he said, no. Targeted assassinations of laws and targeted assassinations of institutions right now. He's saying what you're saying, that the system does not work. But then there's a reality to this. It is, um, does your going to jail make a difference? Because your going to jail is, if you're lucky, there's a short video of another person being hauled off, massive. When you're in jail, you're not gonna get a lot done. And it's gonna be expensive. And you're gonna have to pay a whole lot of money to get out of jail. And then you are financially hit by it. So the question is, is it that level of demonstration of civil disobedience that we have to get to. And, and you know, Gandhi is one of my heroes. And Gandhi went to jail over and over and over. Right. Gandhi finally died for it. And yet, maybe that really is the level that we, we do need to get to now. Is I've, I've not wanted to go to jail. I can't type, I don't have a computer there. I, I don't want to go to jail either. But on the other hand, I do think that this gets the attention of the fossil fuel companies in a way that nothing else does. The only way within a capitalist system, which I sincerely hope we no longer have very soon, but within a capitalist system, that you get the attention of the corporations that are committing the crimes against humanity is to hit them in the pocketbook. There is no other way. And this kind of thing hits them in the pocketbook and it does get their attention. And I think we have to hit them in the pocketbook, pocketbook badly enough that we make them stop. And we have to make them stop. There can is I, no other way. Can I say something? Uh, you know, individuals getting arrested, you know, really isn't that effective. But do you think uh, what just happened when uh, Trump had the Muslim ban and there was a oh, spontaneous yeah. uh, shutdown of the air, airports, you know, which shut down the whole uh, system? And that's basically what has to happen. Absolutely. You, know, you have to and have massive. And that's but it starts with the individual arrests. Right. You know, generally speaking, that's how that's how change 
you know, it, it builds up over time. You know, we don't, we're not usually lucky enough to have a single event that unites people so immediately, although that was, that was a beautiful thing when that happened. Right. But you know, it's interesting, I was thinking in particular about scientists, and you, you know, of course you mentioned Jim Henson as well. And at our uh, hearing, we had a necessity defense hearing in Minnesota last month. Um, and the thing that I realized only afterwards that was actually kind of funny, if you thought about it, was the prosecutor asked each of us, so there were the two of us actually shut the valves, and then um, Ben, who's here also, was our support person, uh, and then Steve, our videographer. Um, you know, the, he uh, was, when the prosecutor asked each of us questions, uh, he was like, and do you have a science degree? You know, and, and in other words, like, why do you have the right to believe this? Why do you have a right to think that it's so urgent? Um, and at the time, of course, what he didn't realize was that Steve, at least, do, it was in fact a yeah. practicing biologist, uh, <laughs> which really, which was, which was good. But, but I realized also that the, that the on the flip side of that is what Jim Henson has gotten from day one is scientists shouldn't do these things. So if you're not a scientist, apparently you shouldn't do it, and if you are a scientist, apparently you shouldn't do it. Which is how we get where we are. Which is that everything stays the same. You know. Um, yeah, so I mean, it's just interesting that, you know, to my mind, and also when we saw the scientists' protests, you know, uh, once starting with the uh, election, right? Yes. And, you know, and I know some other folks who organized um, the one in Massachusetts, and uh, and that's a great thing, like to have, to, to begin to give scientists the sort of perspective that there's a need to engage socially like that, that just being a scientist does not actually exempt you from the same responsibilities we all have. Right? Even if it also means that you have to be like, more careful about how you talk about it or more careful about your data, certainly. Um, but yeah, anyway, I guess I don't, I don't have a question involved in that except sort of to think about, uh, to ask you, you know, do you have more thoughts on, on scientists' involvement in all of this? And sort of, do you think that the scientists have the same set of responsibilities or do you think that, um, and when you have thought yourself about doing things where you might get arrested or whatever, um, you know, how do you think being a scientist changes that? Because I think it gives you, in addition to being somewhat more problematic for you to do that, no doubt, it, it also gives you a lot more power and impact uh, in many ways than some of us could have. You know, when Jim Hansen got up there and got arrested, you know, like, I think that resonated for a lot of people really differently than, than when I did. <laughs> True, but I, I, let me tell you also how the system fights back. Yeah. So I was, I went to the University of Washington I went off and got my PhD elsewhere, but I came back as a faculty member uh, after getting to be a full professor at the University of California. At a young age, I came up here and took a position in 1985. Um, I have been here till 2017. I have the lowest salary of a science professor at the University of Washington. And the reason is, is I'm obnoxious. And I've been really obnoxious with this administration, with the last several administrations, with my chairs, I actually fight authority. And so the screaming and yelling, what they do is they, they kick you back. We've just got another 2% raise uh, for those with merit. I was found not to have merit. Mm. So I've just finished my 19th book. I have, I think, five, six articles published. I have $200,000 grant at the age of 68 from National Science Foundation, but I'm not meritorious. Mm, wow. wow. And I'm not meritorious because... Because you're a pain in the ass. Well, I am. <laughs> and I, I want to look at the University of Washington and our current president, and what percentage of Chinese nationals are taking the place of Washington State residents for the money? My son was not allowed in UW, and a Chinese person took his place because they pay more. So I understand the, the aspects of money, but then when we were paying our president, a million dollars a year, and the administrators routinely make two to three to top four times as much as professors do. Why? Why? Yeah. I mean, why does that place have that level of bureaucracy? But where I got in trouble is I advocated for a faculty union that we replace the Board of Regents as constituted with at least putting on one professor, active professor, and one current student getting people in there. And why don't we have community activists in, instead of these billionaires? Because almost everybody on that board of regents is a billionaire. Mm -hmm. They will not allow rattling the cage. And this is the University of Washington, right? The famous place, which is actually the University of Gates and Allen. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. They're fighting building by building, yeah. and it will soon be the University of Gates and Allen and Bezos. Right. Yeah. And yeah. meanwhile, also the highest paid faculty in most uh, universities is the football coach, generally, oh, as I understand it. Totally. <laughs> totally. Yeah. totally. I'd, I'd like to go back to something you said earlier. You talked about kind of your best case scenario of us peaking at 500 parts per million and of, of, of CO2 in the atmosphere. And in my career, I did a lot of risk assessments, and we primarily looked at two things. We looked at the probability of the risk, and we looked at the impact if that event happened. Um, in, and in this case, getting to 500 parts per million, could you talk about um, you know, the likely increase in, in average global temperatures and the kind of risk that presents? Yeah, yeah. Um, that, that seems like if it's even a low probability, that's such a huge risk to human civilization. Why, why should uh, people just continue the way that they're doing? Why should we go to work? Why should we continue to do the things that are not working? Wow. <laughs> <There's>, yeah. <laughs> Look, I'm hearing you, but also... A lot of the people, and I think the people we need to be talking to, are young parents as well. And the young parents are going to go to work because they'll do anything they have to do to feed their kids. And this is, again, goes right back to endangered species. People will do what they have to do, and quite often that means killing off endangered species to make sure your kids feed. And, I, I, and yet in the long run, it means the deaths of you know, millions of people and often including, you know, our own future generations. I agree. So it's long term, you know, you may be going to work for some killer corporation today which may feed your children today, but it's, it's killing the future for your own children. It is, but again, if a parent faced with, I've got this job or no job, and Kids, you know, kids, kids sitting there, they need to get fed, they need the education, and so people end up doing the conservative aspect. I mean, I'm trying to figure out how did the world get to the point where it takes two working parents to own a house? Oh, even, to even rent an apartment. Most not, my kids can't own a house with two with two two working people. Forget it. That's out. So no, it, it's just it's just to be fed and, and housed at all. So the system is working in that particular way. My own sense is that we all should be wearing t-shirts, say, save the ice sheets. People worry about ice caps, but again, I keep going back. The sea level rise is the greatest single existential threat. And the bad news is, here's the other one that really bothers me a lot, is that you hear a lot of people, and I have these conversations, for some reason I've been on podcasts for the last week, just a whole bunch of them, people just, D discovered me right now, really? <laughs> Where were we 20 years ago, dude? <laughs> so, but then I, I was talking to this 20 year old kid who started his own podcast, you know, and he maybe has five people listening to it. So I did an hour and a half with him. But then his point was well, you know, so many people say that human species is going to be dead in the next 50 years. Or Martin Rees, the astronomer royal, published a book a few years ago. Hilarious. It said, Our Final Hour. That was the title in the US. But in the Great Britain, it was titled Our Final Century. So, I mean, the same book, right? So, <laughs> but you get this, oh, we'll be gone. And a lot of people say, why should I change anything? Because we're going to be gone in 20 it's years. It's a world toast anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. And, and that's a very prevalent attitude. Right. And my, I try to, every one of my books, I've tried to say that we are the most extinction proof creature on this planet. The fact that we can build a gas mask when the H2 hits, that, that we can take on clothes, take off clothes, we can change temperatures, we can build refrigerators. We, we can, don't miss anything. We can do that stuff. But existing doesn't mean existing in peace or in happiness. Mm. That uh, The human happiness over the next century, I think, is not only endangered, but predictably extinct. There will be more miserable people. The other thing I go back to, every single equatorial people uses drugs. Hardcore drugs. On the equator, it doesn't matter where you are, you've got it. In the, in the South Pacific, it's betel nut. Um, you chew coca leaves in, in South America. You have ganja. You have cot. You have all these drugs. because And all they, they, they were before 
air conditioners because living on the, on, in the equator is miserable. In Fiji, everybody has a bowl of this root that they just drink and it just makes time just percolate a little bit better. So you, you can get this stuff and you can get through the day because that's what existence in an overheated planet is like. And so what we're doing is we're expanding the equator. Mi miserable, life is miserable in heat. I mean, it's just it doesn't matter if you were born in it, if you were, we are were, we were just at a terrible state. So we're moving towards an ever greater, more miserable group of people because of that heat. And it's the heat that we're producing. So I'm not advocating everybody ought to start taking drugs, but when I've lived in those places, and man, it's, the beetle nut itself is just unbelievable. If you've been to the South Seas where every sidewalk is red, and, and Air New Guinea has a big sign, whereas other airplanes say, no smoking, they say, no chewing in the aisle, because you're spitting red stuff all over, but just to be drugged out, 95% of the population drugged out. And, and that is, to me, the this, this sense that our happiness is in danger much more than our species' existence. Well, the northern climates people drink, so, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah, there we go. It's, there we go. Humans are just like that. Hmm. Well. So in terms of getting back to a stable climate for our kids, I think uh, Leonard was trying to ask this question about risk. Um, how much more risk do you think uh, human civilization should allow from today's levels of CO2, and how quickly do you think we should uh, rein ourselves in? Well, we should have done it 20 years ago. I mean, I think we're past a bunch of tipping points. I think that what we just saw in Houston, we've been dodging the bullet for the last 10 years in these hurricanes. You know, it's just been sheer dumb luck. It's like watching any of these Star Wars movies where the guys in the white suits shoot. They'll never hit you. No matter how many bullets there are, the good guys always, and for some reason we've been missing the bullets, and all of a sudden now they're starting to hit. And I think we could expect that just random chance is going to bring it back to the level of these particular storms. And this is going to become the new norm. And it goes back to, again, economics. How much money are we going to put into these cities time after time after time? How many times are you going to have to put out however many billions it is to rescue Houston. What if this happened 10 years in a row? In the 10th year, are they going to put that money out? But the question then becomes, places that don't get hit like that, I think what the Northwest of the United States has no conception of is the population migrations that are going to be taking place flooding into this region. Yes. Already our house Except prices... we're going to choke on smoke, so that's, that's not going to be such a... Well, but it's not going to kill us. Whereas, how many people are going to drown again in these... Yeah. Again, I'm, and the old folks in that, I'm the hideousness in Florida, they're, they're letting the old die? This is triage. And this triage, as you start seeing this year after year, this is a direct result of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Risk assessment, we're way past the, what we should be. And why, why isn't every roof in America painted white? Pretty damn easy. Make white roofs. Every roof in Australia should be painted white. Why isn't there a solar panel collector on every roof in America? You just do those two things, and you've made a huge change. I mean, we're going to have to give up certain habitats. Um, deserts? I'm afraid, sorry, we're going to have to put tinfoil over deserts for reflectivity. We're, we're going to be killing off entire ecosystems by necessity if we want for the greater good of not really going into the runaway greenhouse. So there's really hard choices to be made. And environmental groups, they don't want to hear that. I don't want to give up the Sonora Desert. You may have to, right? We may, in, this, in the long run, if we want to get off fossil fuels, we need solar, but we need solar in gigantic quantities. We need gigantic areas that are going to be the power producers. Or we're going to have enormous population crashes. I don't think personally, that we're going to see much climate action until we start having big mortality events. And the mortality events that I see starting to come are going to be the heat events. I mean, you can, if it gets cold, you can put a coat on, but if you don't have power and you've taken all your clothes off already, I mean, some of these European heat waves that have happened, it's really dreadful, and they will start taking out the at-risk populations in ever greater numbers. And that's what we have to look forward to.
Oh, this is cheerful. I was going to say, on that, <laughs> on, on that this, cheerful note. Yeah. This yep. is where you get REM, it's the end of the world <laughs> as we know it, and I feel <laughs> shitty. <laughs> but there is still a lot we can do. And there is. one thing, you know, that, I mean, it's, uh, you know, you talked about, like, I actually, when you, when you said the comment about, we should have done this 20 years ago, it made me think of your response to Annette, which is, this is the system we have. This is where we are. Uh, and yes, of course, we should have done these things 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, but we didn't. And there is still quite a lot that we can do. And I, uh, I'll just jump in here to say something that I've been sort of harping on recently, which is that like the, the zone in between like 10% of biodiversity loss and 95% of biodiversity loss, that's a pretty meaningful zone. <laughs> yes. uh, and, and we still have a lot of power to affect where in that zone we fall. Um, and, you know, humans may or may not, you know, last more than a few more centuries, uh, you know, but, but we, nobody knows anything for sure, uh, except that we're in facing real risk and real threats, uh, and that there's still a lot we can do to it, we have to do about it, we have to, first and foremost, you know, massively uh, reduce emissions, carbon emissions, um, and then also do everything we can to do, like, regenerative farming and tree planting and, and all of that, so I think... Probably we all agree on that, which is, yes. you know, <laughs> a nice thing. And, and um, I look at our action shutting down the pipelines as a very optimistic action. Totally. We did that because we believe there's time to change things. We, yeah, we believe that. And that we that, can do it. Yeah, exactly. And that spurring, spurring the kind of, you know, uh, consideration and thought that we hope that that spurred in a lot of people will get people to respond somewhat differently to their lives. And certainly a lot of the people that we've spoken to, which is a small and select group for sure, um, but a lot of people say that they were you know, really inspired by that and that it made them change their minds yeah. about if, what they could if do. If enough people shut enough things down, we can actually turn this around. And you know, we have heard from people that, wow, you could do that. <laughs> Anybody else, Michael or Ken especially? They might be off the phone. Ah, okay. All right, well, Peter, thank you so, so much for joining us. Thank you. Uh, and You yeah. guys have inspired me. Okay. My favorite book is The Monkey Ranch Gang. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Everybody have a good, have a good day. <laughs> thank Thanks you. for listening. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Bye, everyone. I... You guys have humbled me. Are we off? All right. Yeah. You're doing okay. stuff, Goodness. right? Uh, thank you, Charles. Thank you. Yeah. Well, yeah, well thank you, sounds like yeah. you, you've been a squeaking wheel for a lot well, longer than I have. Free. And are you can for it yourself. Well, they, again, they will, UW is not going to reward it. They're not going to what? They're not going to reward yeah. any of this stuff. Nobody, right? I mean, that's the thing, right? Like, power is never going to reward with the stuff that we do. Whether whether we're irritating them in within the, the academy or irritating them in the political system or, you know. Well, there's always some price to be paid. There is. Oh, you want to see Sammy? Here's the Sammy the dog. He's a sweet spaniel. How did it go, y'all?